Hey guys, how you doing? Welcome back to my channel. My name's Kate Arnell. I hope you're well. If you're new here, welcome. I wanted to sit down and maybe start filming a series of videos sharing with you guys some of the ways I've managed to go kind of plastic free when it comes to like baby and kids stuff. The whole sector is basically rife with unnecessary plastic in my humble opinion. And I'll share a bunch of links below as to why one might want to minimize the amount of plastic that our kids are exposed to on the daily. So yeah, I just wanted to sit down and basically share with you guys what worked for us. Now, I am not any sort of medical professional. I am not a nutritionist. I am not a baby or child expert. I'm none of those things. I'm just a mother figuring out <laughs> how to minimize the amount of plastic in my child's life and obviously our lives as well. And I have ummed and awed about making these sorts of videos because I really don't want them to sound like preachy or be overwhelming or make anyone feel bad about anything they're doing because quite frankly, early parenthood especially is quite overwhelming. There's a lot of brand new information um, and we're all just doing our best. But then I thought it could actually be kind of useful to see what we used and you might think, great, that's a brilliant idea. Or you might think, my goodness me, Kate, what are you doing? But if anything, hopefully you'll just have a nice time watching this video. So that's where my head's been at. Um, I definitely want to do a series of these videos in different categories. So things like uh, bath time stuff and plastic free toys, arts and crafts, all that sort of jazz. So today's video is all about feeding and eating and what worked for me. I'm gonna put all the links in the description box below. So check those out if you like. And yeah, let's get into the video. I've got a, a list here and I'm gonna try and scroll with my toes on my laptop. It's working. Okay, I think I'll start with kind of the breastfeeding milk sort of stuff. So as I mentioned in a different video, I can't remember which one, uh, so I'll mention it again. I really struggled with breastfeeding initially. During pregnancy, I was like, oh, I'm sure it'll be easy. It's totally natural, no problem. My mum didn't have any issues. I just thought, you know what? It's gonna be a breeze. Um, turns out I have very sensitive nipples, TMI maybe, but I know I'm probably not the only one out there. And whenever my baby latched on, the pain was excruciating. I've never felt anything like it. My whole body was writhing in agony and I kind of had to like kick my leg out to try and release some of the pain. So I found myself from quite early on dreading breastfeeds. So in a bit of a delirious and pain-fueled panic, um, I sent my husband out to grab some baby formula. We were really lucky at the time because we lived near this like organic mini market thing that sold pretty much every organic thing you could ever wish for. <laughs> and they had a brand called Holla. I'm probably not pronouncing that right. It's probably supposed to be like Hula or Hull or something. But they make organic baby formula. So we bought two versions of those. There was a goat milk one and a cow's milk one. And they were just what I needed. They allowed me to kind of take a break if I needed to from breastfeeding and I'll get onto this in a little bit, but I hadn't even bought any kind of pump or anything. And I was a bit sort of squeamish around squeezing milk out. And I will say the main thing that saved my breastfeeding journey, actually there were two things, but the main one was having an amazing, and I mean amazing lactation consultant. Um, I'll link her in the info box below in case you are based in the UK. I think she does travel around a lot. She was epic. She's also a tongue tie specialist and she can do cranial sacral um, what do you call it? It's not really massage, but she does cranial sacral, uh, which releases a lot of tension in the body. Um, she did a little bit on me as well, because I think the way I had been hunching over trying to breastfeed had uh, caused a few issues, but mostly um, she did a little bit of work on my baby and you could just see his body relax afterwards and beforehand he did look kind of like tense on one side and I think that was really affecting how he latched on to one side. So. That was brilliant. And she introduced me to nipple shields. And a few friends had previously mentioned them. I wasn't really sure what I was doing with them. So I needed someone like her to actually show me how to use them. Um, if I can find any videos that l sort of show you how to use them properly, I'll try and link those in the info box below. Um, but essentially those were a complete revelation for me and really transformed our breastfeeding journey. Now I know that there's some chat around not using nipple shields for very long. I personally found that 
I only needed them for about six months. I have heard of people using them for longer. Um, so yeah, have a chat with an expert about that if you need to. But essentially, I just had to do what worked for me and nipple shields were just fantastic. I'll link the ones that we used in the info box below. They are silicone, but they come in like a little plastic, what's the word, carry case. And if you're not sure what a nipple shield is, it's a piece of silicone that's shaped like a nipple really and it has a kind of bit that sits on the actual breast as well and you just place it over your nipple and it seemed to make it a lot easier for my uh, baby to be able to latch on and stay on. I do also have quite flat nipples, we didn't realise I'd be talking quite so much about my nipples in this video but hey ho, there we go, you're welcome. I'll try and nip it in the bud soon. So yeah, an amazing lactation consultant and nipple shields really made it so that I could go from combination feeding of breast milk and formula to full-time breastfeeding after the first month. So because we used some formula and then also a little bit of expressed breast milk, um, we needed some bottles. So luckily I think I'd either been sent some or I found some glass baby bottles that have either a silicone teat, is that the word? Or, or one made from natural rubber. Again, I'll link those in the info box below, but there are actually way more to choose from now. I think they've become a bit more popular. I just really liked knowing that my baby was drinking out of a bottle that wasn't made from plastic. I've actually kept some of the smaller ones to use as a little vase in the kitchen for some flowers. All right, let's talk breast pump. This has definitely seen better days. I've just dug it out of storage. I didn't think I would need one again because I just assumed that breastfeeding was gonna come totally naturally and I would just pick up my baby, they'd latch on and we'd just lie there dreamily feeding. Um, the reality, like I said, was um, a stark contrast to that. So I found myself trying to find a plastic-free breast pump. I initially borrowed a breast pump from a friend of mine. It was one that you were kind of tethered to. You couldn't really do anything else whilst you were pumping. So I found that quite limiting. So in the end, I bought a hacker. This is a very basic version. I think they've since modified them to, to be like a bit sturdier and they have a little suction cup on the bottom to stop them from falling over because you will cry over spilt milk <laughs> if you've just spent a while collecting it. But this is the one that I mostly used and it was just brilliant. It was transformative. You essentially squeeze it, pop it on over where it needs to go, release and then the suction sort of draws out the milk and it collects an astonishing amount of milk. I remember having a couple of the uh, midwives come over in the first couple of weeks shortly after I'd bought this and they were all like, what is this thing? It's like, it's a hacker. They were like, wow, we've got to tell everyone about it. And it's actually really affordable as well compared to a lot of other breast pumps. And I think they're always looking for affordable recommendations. I had two of these because they got full quite quickly. Sometimes it was just handy to have one on each breast. Now, one thing I didn't know until I started breastfeeding um, was that milk comes out both sides. No matter which side you're feeding on, milk will sort of pour out the other side as well. So it's really handy whilst feeding on one side to put this on the other and it just collects the milk that's coming out and you can sort of store that and save it for later. And we just used glass jars to store any milk if we needed to. But more than anything, it was great at just stopping any leakage <laughs> going everywhere. I'm gonna squeeze it. There you go, you get the idea. Sometimes I would just walk around the house with two of these on completely topless <laughs> and hope that nobody knocked at the door. I didn't really do this, but I have seen some people fold that bit back to then get a really kind of deep latch on. I've also seen some people fill this with, I think like Epsom salts and water um, to help with any blocked ducts. If I can find a video or something showing that, I'll link it in the info box below. I just wanna really highly recommend the Hacker. So good. And I'm now thinking I could probably use it as a bath toy. <laughs> Quite good for like scooping and pouring and squeezing. Oh, I should also mention milk banks um, are an option as well. It was something I just didn't have the headspace to research or get into. But again, if I can find any info about those, I'll put them in the info box below. Um, basically it's donated breast milk. So often people have a surplus. I think once I got established, I definitely, was an overproducer. All right, I think that's most of the sort of milk related stuff. Now let's get on to solids, introducing solids and the stuff that we used for that. Initially, I got some terrible advice from a midwife saying that I should introduce solids uh, earlier than 
is probably best. So I did that for about two days and th then realized actually, no, we're gonna wait a bit. During those two days, I did make purees. Um, I just steamed vegetables, blended them up with a stick blender um, and then put them in an ice cube tray like this one. It's a metal ice cube tray. You get quite a good size cube from it and I would just defrost that and then we use that. <laughs> but I only did it for about two days so we ended up with quite a few of those left over. But I personally found I didn't enjoy making purees and I just had something in me saying like go straight to like finger foods and baby led weaning. It, I just felt much more aligned with baby led weaning. So that is what we ended up doing. So this book which <laughs> is basically falling apart now um, because I've used it so much is brilliant. It was recommended to me by a good friend of mine and I just want to recommend it to everyone. It sort of talks a lot about the reasons why there are so many positives to baby led weaning and I could just see that my baby was very happy to just grab chunks of things and chew on them and enjoy them. So we very much went down this route and I took a very relaxed approach to it all so you mostly just had whatever I was having, but bigger piece to hold, or things were cut in a certain way, but it was essentially the same stuff that we were having. Um, there are some really, really, really good recipes in this, and I still make a lot of them. Even the things like the quiche I make pretty much most weeks. Fish cakes, yeah, really highly recommend. And I also got this book as well, Super Nutrition for Babies. Now this has got so much valuable information in it and it really goes into like nutritious first foods. So things that are iron rich like liver. It does have puree options in it too. It's all about getting like packing in the nutrition. It very much follows the Western A price approach to sort of food and nutrition. I still find myself using the old recipe from this to be honest. <laughs> I think that's what I like about a lot of these books is that you just keep them and dip into them. They say they're for babies and kids but really it's for the whole family. Marrow and mash so using bone marrow and mash, mashed uh, vegetables, cod liver oil. I'm also gonna link in the info box below to Lucinda who runs Nature Doc. I met her at a sort of panel event a couple of years ago and she is super knowledgeable about everything to do with kids nutrition basically and she's really up to date and all the like, latest information. She has written a couple of books as well. I have the good stuff and we use a lot of the recipes from that as well and what I love about it is that it's, they're quite adaptable recipes so if you want a gluten-free version or an egg-free version or a nut-free version she's got little swap outs that you can do. Um, so we make a, yeah, a lot of good stuff from the Good Stuff cookbook. We didn't actually ever do any bought baby food, mainly because obviously so much of it is heavily packaged and most of that packaging is plastic, but also because a lot of baby food, especially like purees and things, might even be older than your baby. They're not particularly fresh ingredients, goodness knows how long they've been sitting on a shelf. There is one company, and if I can think of it, I will link it in the info box below, and it's the only one I've thought, ah, they seem pretty decent. I'm pretty sure they were doing like freshly made like kiddie meals to your door without plastic packaging. If I can think of it and remember it, I will link it in the info box below. So I either for a couple of days made a few, <laughs> few purees and froze them and then defrosted them. If we needed to go out and about, we'd just grab something out and about. If I was eating, whatever I was eating, basically I'd give some of that to my child or prep something like a few carrot sticks and a blob of something to dip it in and maybe a bit of bread and butter and some leftovers or whatever in a sort of tin so I'd carry that around with us but most of the time if I was going out I was going to eat in a cafe and my son would just share in whatever I was having. For me it was more important like when we were at home having like proper home cooked meals. I think I'm also a very go with the flow kind of person I'm realizing more and more <laughs> um, and not everyone is like that. Some people like I think a lot of people actually like kind of routine and planning and all of that jazz. I don't think it really matters. It's just that I'm a very, yeah, let's go with the flow and see what happens kind of person. When it came to choosing a high chair, I went for the Stocker Trip Trap. I think that's how you pronounce it, Stocker or Stock. I'll link it. Because it's mostly made of wood and it's super adaptable. So it pretty much grows with your child. You can use it as a chair to sit on as an adult. So it could definitely be a long-term 
family chair if needed. I managed to find one second hand and it's still going strong. We use it obviously every day and it's super, super easy to clean as well. And I like that it's basically been designed to last a very, very long time. On the floor, I would just put down like an old towel, especially in the early months when food did kind of end up going just a bit everywhere really. <laughs> so I'd put a towel over our sofa that was kind of nearby at the time in our old flat. And then on the floor, I'd just put an old towel down as well. And what I loved is that I could just gather them up, shake out any crumbs either out a window or outside, and then just whack them in the laundry if they really needed it or save them until the next meal. So when we started introducing solids, I basically just served it all up on an old wooden chopping board. This one is from Ikea. <laughs> you might remember it from a really, really, really old video many, many years ago. Um, but yeah, it's just an old bamboo chopping board. Got a good weight to it, so it wasn't gonna go flying off the table. I would put this down at the table. Oh, that's what I forgot to say. The, um, the Stocker Trip Trap chair basically means your kid is joining you at the table. I think you can get an attachment, which is like a little tray thing that can be attached. So if you want it to be more like a traditional high chair, you can do that. But I really liked that for the most part, you can bring it up to the table that you're eating at and your child can join you. I'd either just put food down straight on the table for him to enjoy, but if I wanted to sort of protect the table a bit, I would just put down this chopping board. I'd put various bits of like smoked salmon, a bit of scrambled eggs, some vegetables, piece of meat. I'd just whack it all down on there. Um, so we didn't go down the whole like divided plates or bowls or any sort of any of that jazz. I just threw it all down on the surface in front and let him enjoy playing with the food and obviously eating the food as well. My kid loves eating with his hands. He, I think it's really important when they're babies anyway, just to have that like sensory input. But I did also buy just like a little wooden spoon. Uh, and we also just used metal teaspoons as well. For the most part, he was a real like, he still is like a hands-on eater. And then when he got a little bit older and started experimenting with like proper cutlery, um, we got this. Set. These are actually all secondhand from a family member who wasn't really using them anymore. But originally they're from Ikea. It's a set of a fork, a spoon and a knife. The knife I think is in the dishwasher at the moment. What I also like is that we'll likely continue to use these like long after my son has finished with them. They'll just be like useful to have around the house. It's not obviously like baby or kiddie stuff. And then when it came to introducing a cup, uh, we used these little glass, what's the word? Shot glasses? They're not tumblers. So yeah, I'll call them like a little shot glass by Duralex. So they're kind of designed for a lot of use in cafes and stuff. It's pretty sturdy glass. So when I first introduced this, I was doing most of the holding and then um, my son would sort of use his hands as well and help guide it. And then eventually he'd start like picking it up and using it himself. I mean, I was always there kind of watching and making sure that this didn't go flying across the room or anything. But yeah, it was very simple and easy to use. And also if we were out and about, I, he could just have a sip from whatever glass or anything that I was using. But there are lots of reasons to avoid sippy cups and not just because a lot of them are made from plastic. Um, I think a lot of dentists recommend avoiding them. Again, I'll put some links in the info box below if you want to read up on that. But generally, from what I've read, sippy cups aren't such a good idea. You can also get like little metal ones of these. I found one or two in a charity shop, um, which also worked well. So if glass makes you feel a bit nervous, then using a metal little cup would also work. Again, these are something we're gonna continue to use for a tot of rum <laughs> in the evenings. I also had a little enamelware cup that with a little handle on the side that he would like drinking from as well. I think that has ended up in a sort of makeshift mud kitchen in the garden. <laughs> so I think some of the enamel actually chipped off on it and it, I was like, I don't think we should drink from that anymore. So that's something to be aware of with like enamelware stuff that it can chip easily. So personally, I would always choose stainless steel wherever possible. And now that he's a bit older, he drinks a lot of any sort of warm hot drinks or like chicken stock or something from like a ceramic, that's the word, isn't it? <laughs> Cup, um, it's got a lovely little lip on it. It's a nice dinky size. Um, I love the shape of it. There's something so kind of like nostalgic and cozy and farmhousey and traditional about it. I just really like it. I actually love 
drinking from it as well. So we've got a few of these. So it was actually quite tricky to find a like plastic free feeding apron or bib because even a lot of the organic ones have got a sort of, I think it's acrylic coating on them, but I did have some success. So these are from the organic company. They're like long bibs made from organic cotton and they have like an adjustable strap with poppers around the back. And it's, I mean, it's so long, it does actually kind of cover their laps a bit as well. So I bought several of these as I really liked that they are all natural material um, and I would just use a different one for each meal time and then whack them in the wash <laughs> at the end of the day. And this next item is like super crumpled. I've just dragged it out of storage. So for the times when I wanted a bit more coverage, a bit more of a like smock, I guess you'd call it, um, I found these organic cotton, like they're little artist smocks <laughs> or aprons or whatever you want to call them. Um, and I love them, but they worked perfectly for meal times. So they're not protected with any sort of like wipeable coating, but I really like that. I like that it's just natural materials. I bought a few of these again, and then I would just like throw them in the wash as and when. They go over the head, um, and then basically arms obviously go through there and just cover the body brilliantly. And they come in different sizes. So this was basically the only natural version of this style of bib that I could find. And then if it got too small to go over his head, but it wasn't quite time to size up to the next size, I would just cut it open and then pin it at the back during meal times. And I guess if you're someone who's any good with a sewing machine or quite good at like making these kinds of things, then you could totally make your own smock bib thing. But I was delighted to find these. So yeah, I'll link those in the info box below. Instead of plastic plates and bowls, I opted for metal ones. These ones are like enamel wear, um, but they're really sturdy. Like we've had these for four years and they've only just started to chip a little bit now. Whereas a lot of enamel wear does chip easily, I will say. Also, these are quite weighty ones. So they're not as light as usual enamel wear. But if I could find stainless steel ones, I probably would have chosen those. These are from Dalesford. Um, and yeah, we still use these a lot, obviously for my son to eat from, but I find them quite useful as like a little snack plate uh, or if I fancy a little bowl of something. It's again, stuff that we can continue to use for a really long time. Obviously we didn't use wet wipes. They're one of my bugbears. So if we were at home, I'd either run a cloth or a wipe or a muslin under the warm tap and then wipe pans and mouth and wherever else food had gone. Or I'd just bring a cup of warm water to the table and I can just like dip it in and wipe whenever needed. Uh, so that was super handy. If we were out and about, again, I'd just get a cup of warm water from a cafe or a restaurant, or I'd just simply use the water in my water bottle to slightly wet it and then wipe. Had no need for wet wipes at all. If you'll happen to be looking for a bottle for yourself. I'm just gonna throw it in here that my husband and I have created a reusable water bottle made from stainless steel that is actually two in one because it has a hidden takeaway coffee cup attached to it. It's called Bottle Cup. I'll link the website in the info box below, but yeah, if you're looking for a super handy two in one, then check it out. Shameless plug over there, actually not not because we've just made it down to the final five in our category for the Dezine Awards, uh, which we're super pumped about. Shameless promotion over officially now. That's pretty much everything. Ah, except this is really random, but ice lolly molds. Uh, we have metal ones. You can either just use a teaspoon as the kind of handle um, or you can buy like bamboo ones. I actually managed to find some with metal popsicle sticks. But yeah, they were brilliant, especially if I made like a smoothie and he only drank a little bit of it and I had loads left over, I could just very easily pour it into these like ice lolly molds, whack them in the freezer, and then it made for a really nice, but fun and sensory experience um, ice lolly snack later. And I knew that there was loads of goodness in there. So yeah, ice lolly molds were such like a random, uh, but actually really useful thing to have. So there we go. I think that's pretty much everything that I wanted to show you in terms of plastic free alternatives when it came to like feeding my child. As I said, I'll leave all the links in the uh, description box below. Thanks so much for watching and yeah, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.